welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 255. I am Lisa Louise Cook, and I'm so glad you're joining me here today. We're going to be talking about the U.S. National Archives and using it for genealogy. Now, it's a wonderful resource of really unique genealogical records. But the National Archives website and online catalog can be a bit mystifying. (laughs) If you've ever tried to search it and wound up kind of frustrated, you're not alone. This is often the case because the nature of the archives and the search function of the online catalog really are not genealogically focused, even though they have terrific records for genealogy research. So armed with an understanding of how and why it is set up the way it is, and the know-how to search, refine, and download documents, you'll be ready to add it to your genealogy toolkit. And that is the goal of this episode. We're going to talk about what kind of records you can find at the National Archives. Uh, Also, which genealogy records are not available. There is no point spending time searching for something that actually isn't available there. And we'll talk about how to effectively search for the records. We'll talk about the uh, search operators that are supported by the catalog, how to use those, and specifically how to zero in on the digital items, because lots of stuff at the National Archives are not digitized, and so this will help also prevent a lot of headache. And we'll also talk about how to download records and um, a very specific little tool they have over there called the Record Group Explorer, which is also a terrific help. Now, this audio comes from my YouTube video series. It's called Elevenses with Lisa. This is originally episode number 40. So as you're listening, if you decide you'd like to see this in action, head over to the show notes for this episode, which again is number 255. And in addition to the media player, which plays the audio podcast, you will also find the video player, which plays the video so that you can follow along with me. But for now, let's jump right in and talk about how to use that U.S. National Archives online catalog for genealogy research. So let's talk about the U.S. National Archives website. We have a couple of key questions we want to answer today. And I'm I'm guessing if I have these questions, I'm guessing you guys have these questions too. So Some of the things we want to just dig into at the website is what kind of records can be found here? I mean, we know the National Archives has a treasure trove, but when we're working from home, what can we do from the website? What can we find there? And then the question would be, how do I search the website? Have you ever done that? Uh, I saw somebody say in the chat that, well, I've gone to the site, but I don't know, it gets kind of overwhelming. I don't really understand the search engine. I'm with you on it. (laughs) Uh, This was not a huge area of expertise of mine because I got to tell you, every time I went to the National Archives website, I would find myself getting a little discouraged. And it's quite a different animal from your standard genealogy website, isn't it? And you kind of get in that mode and people know how genealogists think and what they're looking for and how they ask for things. And then you get to this supposed treasure trove and it doesn't seem to resonate the same way. So we're going to talk about how to do searches and, of course, what you can find when you do those searches. And then we're going to try to improve it. Just how do you do a better uh, search query so that you can get the best results that are available to you? And I think it's really um, important to be thinking about who the National Archives is and kind of what their goals are. When you think about the National Archives, like any record collection, We need to be thinking about who created this and what's their purpose. We talked about that in a previous episode when we were kind of talking about the story behind the records and how important it is to take a moment and really familiarize yourself with who created the collection that you're looking at, what their stated purposes were, you know, because those might be quite different than why you're accessing the records. So what kind of records can we find at archives.org? Well, the National Archives, let's talk about their role. Their role is preserving and making available only the permanent federal government records. 
So the records that the federal government wants to have in a permanent state for ta- all time, that's what gets sent over to the National Archives. So right there, that really corrals your sense of what would be there and what would maybe not be there. Now, some of these have genealogical value. We definitely know that. But many, many don't. So there's a ton of stuff there that you kind of really don't need to worry about. These records are arranged as the agencies who created them as they did it. So there's no master subject or name index. And it's interesting because Lacey and I were talking about this last night uh, when we're talking about records and uh, we're actually talking about, remember Raiders of the Lost Ark and the guy, I think he has the Ark of the Covenant and it's on this big pallet at the end of the movie and he wheels it into the big uh, storage area, and it just becomes more and more vast, and you just see, and, and their whole purpose was to store it and have it be preserved in that it wasn't going to disintegrate. But it wasn't about ever putting your hands on it again or making it easily available to researchers, right, in the movie. Well, I, I kind of think of the National Archives that way to a certain degree, because if you talk to some of the folks there, you know, they're, they know what their job is, but it's not always about um, super convenient availability to access it for, let's say, genealogical purposes. And that's okay, you know, because everybody's got their own stated purpose. Um, but it kind of helps take the pressure off to realize you're not crazy when you go to the website that you're finding it maybe a little more difficult than you thought it would be to find what you want. Um, because that's not really why it's stored the way it's stored. That all makes sense. So these records are arranged as the agencies created them. Now, while they have over 110 million digitized pages in the catalog, that's actually a tiny fraction of what the actual holdings are. So it's a big number. There's a lot there. But we have to kind of get our, our expectations in, in the right perspective that it, there's a very good chance that the actual record that you want is only available physically on site. You're not going to see the digitized copy in the catalog. You might learn a whole lot more about that record collection, and you'll find out what's available and uh, the way in which you would go about accessing it, but you're not actually going to get to see and work with the record right there on the website. But there are some. We want to be able to find those. So other records at the National Archives. So the catalog, what this does is it contains the descriptions for the National Archives nationwide holdings. So what does that include? It includes, of course, the the large archive in Washington, D.C. There's several regional facilities and the presidential libraries. That's the scope. Those are the records that are being cataloged on the website. The catalog currently contains descriptions for about 95% of those records. And they talk about this a lot on the website, that it's by the series level. Okay, so they have their own internal way of thinking about the hierarchy of how these are organized. And they think of that about them in, in collections and series, that may not be as kind of down to the nitty gritty record itself, the page itself, the the individual person themselves. We'll talk more about that, that we're not going to always be looking for individual people the way we would at a genealogy website. And here again, we have to remember that if, let's say, one or two percent are actually available as digital images on the site, 95 percent of what we're going to see in the entire collection is actually talked about in the catalog. So there's still this other 5% that you would really have to go there in person and uh, dig in quite a bit more to try to find what you're looking for, if they had it. So you can find basic information about the records that they have, including the size of the collection, where it's located, and you can see that in the description. That's really their focus in the catalog. And they are regularly adding more file unit and item descriptions. So it might be get up, up to 96%, right? Some of these, as they're adding them, they are adding digital files, which is great. And they have something called the Citizen Archivist. So they're really encouraging the general public to help them 
add more tags, add more descriptions so that things become more findable. So some traditional genealogy records that you're going to find at the National Archives, and you've probably heard different people talk about this as you've gone to different classes or you read books. And of course, we, we know that from the beginning, they've had census records. Well, these days, we don't really think about the National Archives as a place to go get census records because they're so readily available digitally on genealogy websites, many times for free, as in overt family search. Uh, they also have passenger arrival records, and uh, these are very interesting. But again, these days, uh, they have been partnering a lot with many of the genealogy websites. And so we might go to the uh, Ellis Island Foundation website or to Family Search or Ancestry to look for those way before we ever go to the National Archives. Uh, and of course, I'm talking in generalities. There might be very specific situations where this is where you need to go in order to get what you need to get. Um, but generally speaking, we're finding that we're getting greater access through these other websites. Now, they have land records, and uh, some of these are unique. Many of these are available in other areas. They're a little more easily accessible. Military personal personnel records. Now, they have uh, quite a few military records, and in the past, it, it seemed like you, you always had to go in person. We're seeing lately with some of the additions to the catalog that they are starting to add more digital files. I found my, my uncle uh, there in some of their online digital images. But overall, still, I think you're talking about making a trip or getting a researcher on site to, to get more extensive access to the military records. They have court records, of course, federal courts. So if that's the system that the records were generated in, this is a place where you might find it. They have fugitive slave cases, naturalization records, federal employee records, um, you're not going to find any of those, I'm guessing, uh, digitized on the website. But you will learn from the catalog the best way to uh, access them and which location that they're at. And you'll find applications for enrollment in Native American tribes. So there's quite a wide range. And this is just kind of, you know, scratching the surface. Each one of these categories has lots of subcategories. But it gives you a sense of the, the depth of the collection and the fact that all of these areas are ways in which the citizens of the United States interact with the federal government. And when that generates a record, that's what the National Archives is archiving, those that they want to hold permanently. So in most of these areas, though, most of the records are available in person. And since March 13th of 2020, the National Archives and their regional facilities have been closed. So uh, I was checking the website again last night. I don't see any inklings of any kind of variations on openings. There are some instances where you could make a request. But as you can imagine, I don't know uh, to what degree that they are staffed. And there are definitely fees involved if you really are desperate and, and want to get your hands on a record or have them pull one. So that makes the website all the more important. And uh, we can certainly dig in and try to find as much as we can. We talked about a lot of the areas of what they do hold, but what don't they have? Well, if you're looking for birth or marriage, divorce, death records, deeds and wills, these are also traditional genealogical records, but you're not going to find them at the National Archives. And that just kind of helps. It just helps to understand uh, what not to expect, what not even to look for. Uh, because these aren't federally generated, right? That's the key. This is not when somebody is born, it's not registered at the federal government level. This is a local issue. So you'd want to check with the state, the county, the local jurisdiction for these kinds of records. So as, more, as much as we keep this in mind, that's going to help us to um, set our expectations correctly. So how do I search for what is available online in the catalog? Well, we're going to go to archives.gov to do this. And let's just dig in. I mean, I'm going to get over my timidity about this. And hopefully you will too. I learned an awful lot researching for this show today. 
And it's it's really been helpful. And I'm kind of excited about some of the stuff I could find. And I realize now, hmm, I'm going to have to wait till I can go in person to get these other things that I kind of had in the back of my mind. So before we begin our search, just like with any genealogical project, we were talking about um, getting ready for genealogy research success. And we talked about the importance of the research question and knowing what your goals are. It makes you be focused in what you're doing. So we're going to just take a moment and write down what's your question. Now, there's two ways you can approach the catalog as with any website. We can browse or we can do a specific research question. If you're going to browse, I still think it's really uh, helpful. Just think about what topic you want to look for. You're not going to feel happy and satisfied if you go to the National Archives website and think, oh, well, I'll just dig around. And I mean, I've done that. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. It's fruitless. It's, it's not very helpful. Sometimes you'll run into stuff. Sometimes you won't. But if we now kind of keep in mind, okay, from a federal interaction perspective, what topic would I be interested in and pick a topic, I think your browsing will be a lot more satisfying. So take a moment to do that and think about possible ways that your ancestor might have interacted with the federal government that you hadn't considered before. This could be a really fun little project for the next coming weeks to look back over some of uh, maybe some of your direct ancestor lines and say, now, great, great grandfather, okay, this is what he did for a business. This is where he lived. This is what was going on with him. In these categories, I'll have all those in the show notes for this episode for you. You know, did he immigrate? Did he naturalize? Would he have been in the courts, in the federal system? What of those areas would he have touched? And that would be something really interesting then to go and and do some browsing or some looking over at the website. So here's an example of this. Okay, if you're kind of struggling with an idea of what you would tackle first. Let's say you have the question, okay, I'm looking at the 1860 census and the 1870 census. Uh, Maybe I'm over at a genealogy website looking at these. And I'm noticing when they're talking about how much he's worth, what his net worth is that, wow, he went from doing pretty well in 1860 to nearly destitute in 1870. What happened? Okay, so why did my ancestor have a significant decrease in net worth between 1860 and 1870 in the census? Great research question. And one of the possibilities is you could ask yourself, how might your ancestor have interacted with the federal government in this regard? When it comes to that kind of a change in, in a financial situation, well, what about bankruptcy? Now, that could be something that happened at the federal courts. So some of the records that you could think about researching at the National Archives are bankruptcy, because the Bankruptcy Act of 1867 allowed a lot more people to file for voluntary bankruptcy. And you did that in the federal court. So if you went to the National Archives website, and we're going to go dig into the the, uh, catalog in just a moment, you could put bankruptcy and in capital letters, like a search operator kind of a thing and state, okay, or just put the word bankruptcy, and then the state that they lived in, and see what comes up. So we're picking the state where they live during the time of this change in their situation. Do they have any bankruptcy files? That would be very interesting. And then, of course, by digging into the catalog, you're going to try to determine, are the bankruptcy files that I'm looking for already digitized and on the website? Or where are they held? And how would you make plans to access them when that facility becomes open again? So where to start your search on the website? We're going to go to catalog.archives.gov. If you've ever gone to the archives.gov website and said, oh my gosh, where am I supposed to start? This is the address. Just go to this page and then you'll be in the right spot to search the online catalog. And again, we'll have all that in the show notes for you. Types of searches that you can do in the catalog. Well, we can do keyword searches like we would do over at google.com. 
They also have a filtering mechanism so that you can filter your search down or even just kind of dig that way into the catalog itself by clicking each one. And then there's the advanced search as well. Let's search the catalog. You're going to go to catalog.archives.gov. So you can see there's a search field and we are going to type in, let's say, a bounty land. Okay. Now, good news, everybody. You can use some types of search operators at archives. You can use things like quotation marks. We do that with Google search. We talked about in a previous 11s episode here that if we put the quotation marks around a phrase, that helps the search engine understand that um, we want the words bounty and land together in that order, right? So that's really helpful versus if we just put the words bounty and land, we might get some other kind of land rec records and somebody had a bounty on their head. I mean, who knows? Those words would be used in many different ways on each of the results, which would kind of clutter things up. So we can put quotation marks around bounty land. And we're going to click the search little button there. Now notice there is an advanced search button. So if you don't have very much success or you just feel like I really need more help the first time out, click that. It's going to give you a form much like the advanced search over at google.com that'll kind of prompt you. Okay, it'll prompt you for what words do you want to include? Which ones do you want to exclude? What categories or record collections do you want to specifically search? So advanced search is super helpful, but I just want to walk us through some of the basic searches that we can do right here from the search field. So here's our search results. So we have the results. They're returned starting with what they think are the best results at the top. So that's kind of helpful. It's now I'm looking, there's 113,000 results. That's a lot. That feels like Googling, doesn't it? <laughs> well, if you want to view one of these results. You can see they're kind of grouped in little snippets, little paragraphs. Just click on the blue title. But here's what I would recommend. Take a moment when you're looking at a huge list like this and check out the filter. So the, this column on the left, kind of like over at worldcat.org, uh, which is that library card, the worldwide library card catalog. This filtering column on the left is going to really help you get more specific and maybe go even faster directly to any possible digital files that might be available to look at right now from home. So that's on your left. Now you can refine by the type of record that you want. So if you know the type of material that you want, like if you know I'm looking for a map or a photograph or I just want um, textual records, this is where we would do that. We would do under refine by. Now, keep in mind, this does not mean that these items are going to be visible on the screen. It doesn't mean that that material is online. So even though we're selecting photos, and I've done this before, I've come in here and I... I know how it is in other genealogy websites. If I click photos, I'm going to see photos. Except you don't when you do that at the National Archives. And it's kind of disappointing. And then you wonder what you're doing wrong. I always blame myself. Do you ever blame yourself when things go wrong when you're working on a website? Important to know that just because you refined by photos doesn't mean you're going to see photos. It means you're going to see the descriptions of all the photographs that they have cataloged. I have to kind of put the caveats in there that they have cataloged because there might even be photographs that are held somewhere in a box at one of the facilities that's never been cataloged. But generally speaking, we know that they've got about 95% of this stuff listed in the online catalog, but we may not see it. So they don't necessarily include the digital images. That's important to know. Nothing wrong with you. <laughs> you get the descriptions, but indeed you don't see the images. So how can I get maybe better results, things I can use today from home? And specifically, I'd like to see some digital images. Where are they? Okay, let's do that. And we will do that right after this. 
Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full-service experience that bridges your past, present, and future. The MyHeritage DNA Kit reveals your ethnic origins and finds your new relatives based on shared DNA. It's popular all over the world, and their constantly growing DNA database means that more matches to new relatives are just around the corner. You'll receive a percentage breakdown of your ethnic origins from 42 supported regions and weekly email updates as new DNA matches are found. It's also the leading DNA service for anyone with European origins. Make the most of your DNA results with a MyHeritage subscription and access advanced tools for genetic genealogy, like the theory of family relativity, autoclusters, shared ancestral places, and much more. Order your kit today at myheritage.com slash DNA. Already taken a DNA test with another service? Upload your DNA data to MyHeritage for free to receive DNA matches and access new discoveries. That's myheritage.com slash DNA. All right, let's head back and find out how to find those digital images at the National Archive. Here's the key, my friends. Over in the filter, before you even worry about photos or anything else, go to the top of the filter column and click Archival Descriptions with Digital Objects. That's the key. That gets everything out of your search results, that 113,000 that we have, and gets it down to just the items where they've attached digital objects, images. Okay. Wow. Yay. Our list looks so much different now because we're seeing those thumbnails that tell us. And that's, that's the other thing is if you, if you're not seeing a thumbnail, you are probably looking at a list of items that do not have digital images. So you're not going to be able to, um, really specifically work with those within your genealogy research from home. And you'll notice in the results page here at the top, okay, so let's reorient reorient ourselves to the way this is laid out. Where is the original search we did? Up at the very top in the search bar. And advanced search is still there. If you feel like you're stuck, go ahead and click that and, and refine what you're doing. Underneath that search box, we see how many total items are in our results over 113,000. Refinements is right under that. You see the red arrow pointing. You can see when you look at your page, wait wait a minute, what am I looking at? Well, I'm looking at everything that met bounty land, but has digital objects attached to it. Okay. If you don't want that anymore, you want to see everything again, click the little X next to that tag of what you selected and it will take that off and it'll reopen it up back to all the results again. And now we've got pictures. So if we were to click the image or the blue title now, we're going to be able to go and look at that specifically. You could kind of zero in on these digital images. Uh, You could try searching by name. And I've been surprised to find that I have a couple times found records for people that were named. But I know for a fact that there are many records on here where my ancestors are not going to be named in the description, but they're going to be on the records themselves. And that would require a lot more browsing. But if you knew you were in the right collection, it'd be worth doing, right? So if you're going to try by name, as I did with my uncle who had served in World War II, then you would put the person's name in quotation marks, just like we did with our phrase, Bounty Land. You could put uh, Alexander McCoy, put quotes, run that, and now we can see in our search results, we got 21 search results, which is pretty great. (laughs) You got to keep your fingers crossed that happens for you and your ancestors. And in each of the snippets, we see his name in bold. So it's flagging us as to why this item is included in the list. Um, because this person, Alexander McCoy, is listed and named in each one. If we click one of them, then we're looking at, okay, now we're looking at Revolutionary War Pension and Bounty Land Warrant Applications. And this is one that Alexander filled out. If you look over on the left, just below where we were seeing the filters happening, now we're seeing tags. 
And some of this kind of activity, tagging and the extra descriptions and notations and things, these are coming from sometimes citizen archivists, people like you who are taking some time from home to go through and review these images and add that information so that it becomes easier for all of us to be able to find our ancestors. Um, much like the indexing that happens on other genealogy websites, it's, it's really wonderful the way just kind of the research community is helping each other and helping the archives um, do that. Because again, for the National Archives, the priority is really not about making your ancestor's record retrievable, right? It's about permanently storing and preserving records at the federal level that are important to the federal government so that they have them. It's a little different. So love the tags. We can see that we've got the right record. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more because I don't want you to go search for your ancestor's name and be terribly disappointed. So let's look at this a little more specifically. First of all, when you go to search, there is no name field. And that's a great example of how this is so different than going to a genealogy website, even though most of us as genealogists think of the National Archives as one of the, the biggest and most important genealogy resources. But when you go to their catalog, you are not going to find that name search field. So don't worry about that. Remember, we have the advanced search. There's lots of options, but name isn't one of them. So there's a couple of different strategies that you can use. And these are things that they often uh, recommend at the National Archives. You could do something like search on the person's full name in first name, last name order. So search on the person's full name. We had, um, you know, John Doe, but in last name first. Okay. Search only on the surname. You might find if you search only on the surname, surname but then you select that archival objects. Okay, now... While at first you might have a really big list, if you search the objects because you really just want to see what can I work with today in terms of actual images, you're probably going to get a fairly small list, even with only a surname. And certainly this works way better when you have a more unique surname than one that's a little more common. You could also try searching on spelling variations. Um, for example, when I search for Burkett records for my Burkett line, um, there's a lot of variations. So there's Burkett with two T's, with one T, with an E on the end. And certainly throughout the decades and centuries, those could change. So we can do that and we can use the OR operator. So let's put OR between those different variations. We can still get them all in the same search query. We can also search on variant spellings of the name so when you think about your ancestor coming here to America and then their, maybe their first name or their last name gets kind of Americanized, how about Joseph Maggio versus Giuseppe Maggio? If you know that um, they came, let's say, in 1900, you're probably going to want to search on both possibilities, particularly if you found that variation perhaps in a record back in Italy or wherever they came from. So um, they may still use that name for a while when generating records with the federal government. So we want to check both ways. And remember, most descriptions in the catalog don't include the names of people mentioned on the record. It's sad, but it's true. And uh, I want to really drive that home because I don't want you feeling like it's, it's you. In this case, it's, it's not problem and share, not in computer, the picnic thing. It's not you. It's actually that there is no search name field. Um, oftentimes, most of the time, people are not named specifically. If you know that an individual participated in a particular event, search for that in your search term and then look within the record for your ancestor. You're going to have to do the browsing. And they say over at the National Archives website, it may be necessary to closely read records to, of interest to see if a particular in individual is m mentioned. So you're going to have to read through them and be thinking of your ancestor within the context of that topic. And speaking of topics, highly recommend to you to search by topic. This is one of those cases where as special as our ancestor is to us, their name is not there. So we want to be thinking about topics like bounty land and search for those and then filter our way down. The National Archives 
absolutely recommends this. They say you're going to have probably more success searching by topic than by name. And that is very different, isn't it, from the way we search at genealogy websites. So provides uh, a greater number of results since your ancestors often aren't named in the description. Read the description really carefully to see if the item is going to be helpful. And if it's not available online, is it really worth requesting? So read that description really closely. So for example, a topic would be that list we talked about initially, one would be land records. So you might try searching for particular phrases that are kind of keywords or key phrases under that topic. For example, bounty land, homestead, land entry. And sometimes just generally browsing that area, that topic, and kind of seeing what the terminology is that's being used, that will help give you clues on how to do that. For those of you who are premium members, of course, everybody has access to the show notes when we get those published this weekend. Premium members are going to have the downloadable handout step-by-step for what we're covering here today. And I'm going to have a special little bonus handout for you guys. Um, This is a downloadable topic suggestion list. I found this so helpful. As I was researching this, I found many different things that they were saying, oh, this will work well, that will work well. We've got that all pulled together in one list so that when you've picked a topic, I'll have some phrases that you can start using right away that you know are going to be found in the catalog. So look for that in the resources section of the show notes page, which is typically down at the bottom, just above where the comments are uh, at genealogygems.com slash elevenses. And you can find all the show notes for all of our episodes at genealogygems.com. And in the main menu, click Elevens is with Lisa. Okay, then you just pick whichever episode you want to find. So that's going to help you a lot. um, Because, you know, you want to make sure you're searching for the right thing. Now you might want to download a file, you find a digital record like this. Notice that there's a lot of different pages within this particular record. So we can use this little arrow button to scroll to the right, scroll to the left. We can click to select individual pages within this one record. Notice there's this tag. What these blue tags are is it says user contributions. These are those citizen archivists. They've added more information to help you better understand what this record's going to have for you and what it's about. And it really that made it more searchable. Hopefully you'll be able to retrieve it easier because they've done that work. And we have the, the right and left arrows. If you get zoomed in, look for the little button. It's next to the download button. That'll make it back to full page so you can see the whole page. Your download button, that will download the record you're looking at. But if you would like the entire series of pages within this record, come down under documents, look and see if they have a compiled PDF for you. Many times I ran into this and it's really helpful because rather than searching and downloading page by page, you could just get that whole thing down as a PDF. And of course, once you have the PDF, if there are certain pages you don't want, you can always delete those pages, but now you've got it in a form that you can keep on your computer. So download by individual page within the record, or you can also print it out. Once you've got it as a PDF, you can download the entire collection of pages within that record as a PDF. Super handy. Not all of them have it. I did see a couple of records as I was browsing where there were multiple pages, but they did not have the compiled PDF available. So don't worry if you if you don't see that, It just hasn't been created for that particular record. You're going to just need to download. And you can also download but print as PDF yourself, page by page, to your computer. This is kind of fun. We're going to look for records from specific government agencies. So I've told you so many times on this show, I'm a very visual person. It helps me to kind of get a big picture of what is available, what's there, um, how much is there, They have that uh, at the Record Group Explorer. It's a really unique way to visualize and kind of explore the available digitized records at the National Archives website. 
I've got the URL that will be in the show notes for you as well so that you can go directly to this page. All these links, I think you're going to really want the show notes for this episode because it's a big website. And you can just start digging around. And again, it's not laid out the way we think about it for genealogy. So these very specific URLs are going to be super helpful for you. You could bookmark them on your on your browser. Or you, if you are a premium member and you have the PDF, just go and click there because it, it saves you so much time from wandering aimlessly around their website. So this record group explorer tool that they have, this allows you to browse their holdings by record group. And they just live by record groups. That's what it's all about at the National Archives. And you know that if you're fortunate enough get to go back and research in person, you're going to be needing to know what the record group number is for the records that you're looking at or looking for. You can use this Record Group Explorer to get a sense of the scale and the way in which uh, the records are organized. And you can use it to explore what's available online via the catalog. So it, once you get, kind of get the visual, you can click through and access the records. And it provides an overview of the digital scans. So remember those archival objects we filtered down to? When there's a scan attached to a description of the record, um, it's going to provide an overview of that. So whether it's a textual record whether it's a photograph, maps, charts, electronic records, you know, they have audio, they have video, and these are digital files at the National Archives. So here's this Record Group Explorer. Okay, so when you get here, it says here there's 122 million scans online representing about just over 1%. Isn't that amazing? color coding, this is your little key to what you're looking at. The volume, overall, what do they have? That's the light blue. And then the dark blue bars that we're seeing are textual records, records with text on them, images, uh, records online with no text, maybe that's a movie, a video. You can also click this toggle to see whether it's the total amount of records that are available scanned or whether it's the percentage, whatever works for you. They have a lot of district court records of the U.S., a lot of civil service commissions. So the size of the box gives you a sense of proportionately, how does that collection size up compared to all the other ones they have? So here's their record group 146. So if you click through on any of these boxes, you're going to be able to see, huh, not too many scans online, okay? But it gives you a sense of a little bit more information about that record. Now, I know somebody was asking about uh, one time railroad records. I know I have searched for railroad records. There are no retirement records. I had to contact the National Archives directly to get those. So you see kind of an empty box. Here's one, the group 313, zero scans online. If you really want to quickly determine in this area, in this topic, do they have anything? Well, look here, Immigration Naturalization Service, yes. There's actually a large portion, about 23% of Record Group 85 have been digitized and are available online. So this is huge, and it will again break it down. This is just a, n a nice way to become more familiar with this particular collection and uh, see what they have. And they are saying, well, they've got some photographs, they've got electronic records, uh, video and audio. So these are things that are not text pages, but they're things that you can watch and listen. So click through on the box. And this will help again, save you a lot of wasted time looking for something that really isn't online. Now the Confederate records, a large portion, gosh, 60% of those are digitized. And many of these down here do have some. So I know that they continue to add, but you can also look by list. So if you're not so much into the visualization, but you just want to see that, that list, you can switch your view and you can see by record collection how much is there. And you can also, uh, like if I type in 85, then I'm going to get every record collection within the Record Group Explorer that has 85 in the number. So that's a really quick way also to jump directly to the record group that you're interested in. It's a nice way to quickly assess what's the volume of records and um, how much of them are there 
how many are digitized, how does this compare to the rest of their collections. It's also kind of a nice place to go if you just want to do a quick scan of, okay, we were saying search by topic, what, what, again, topics do they have? This is a nice way to easily and quickly review that on one single page. Now, before we wrap up, I just want to mention to you, there are some very interesting things that are digitally available that you can look at today. I don't want you to feel too disappointed that there aren't too many genealogical records there. Um, There are are searchable motion pictures, and they've been putting out on their blog, um, and I subscribe to their blog, I get some of their notifications, and they've been doing more in this area. They get lots of requests for video and photographs, and so they're starting to put more of this online. Now, again probably not going to find your ancestor named, but you could think about where did they work? Where was their home? Where were they located? Um, Were they in the military service? Maybe there's film of the ship on the water that they were on at that time. They have a lot of really interesting stuff. And in particular, there's this one series they were just notifying people about this 306 LSS group. Uh, It's 400 black and white reels of stock footage These are really interesting. They're actually in really great shape. You can watch them from home, um, from the catalog. They come from the United States Information Agency. So they run into these, and they said that the reason that they started digitizing these is they started getting a lot of requests. So somehow this collection got on people's radar. So it shows that when you request things, it can actually influence what gets digitized next. You can check this out. They call it the Searchable Stock Shots. And they come from a lot of different areas across the United States. I've, this one here, this is really cool. It's um, like, what? It, not go-kart racing. Right? Uh, kids, you know, I guess it's go-kart racing. This says British Columbia, Canada. Ah, interesting. So they have a lot of international stuff here, too. There are people's family in these movies, right? These kids belong to somebody. So interesting if you were to think about searching for events, locations, time frames, you might be able to run into maybe that's your dad. (laughs) Who knows? Stand there watching the race. And if you click through, then you can see that uh, they have that little icon that shows you that there's film there that you can see. So they call that searchable stock shots was what I found in the blog. But uh, you can search for that at the catalog and you can watch the movies right from there. So that's just a quick tour. My gosh, we can't cover everything, but you kind of got a starting place. I hope that you feel more confident about understanding what's there, what's not, how to access it and how to get your hands on the stuff that is digitized um, as quickly as possible. Thanks so much for joining me for episode 255. I hope we have demystified the U.S. National Archives online catalog for you. So if you'd like to find the show notes, and I really recommend them for this episode because there's a lot of great detailed information that we've written up for you on the website. That's available for free. You'll find the show notes uh, at genealogygems.com under podcast in the menu and just navigate your way to podcast episode 255. If you are a premium member, and I sure hope you are, there are not one, but two downloads for you to get. The first one is our ad-free show notes cheat sheet. It's a PDF of the entire article step-by-step, everything we talked about in this episode, that you can download so that it's super easy for you to refer back to and be able to quickly search within the document for exactly the stuff that you're looking for. And there's also that other bonus download that I mentioned during the episode. So you will find both downloads. There's a link in the show notes for this episode. And you can also find them on the video 11s is with Lisa episode number 40 show notes page under the resources section. All right, well, thank you so much for listening, my friend. I will talk to you soon.